Of course, given the numbers here this evening, it seems to me that it is a matter of great interest to the young Muslims of Bradford as to when the Jal is coming and when Imam Mahdi is coming. Of course, a lot of this is hypothecated by those who make assumptions like Nostradamus and those that make other hypothecations like uh, would-be awliya and would-be of Ghos and Qutubs. But really this sensationalism is nothing new. In the time of the Sahaba, in the time of Prophet ﷺ, one day they all gathered in the Prophet's mosque and they said, Ya Rasulullah ﷺ, tell us about the future. Tell us about the end of time. So obviously it's a very sensational topic. It's a very um, emotional topic. It's a very... Um, you know, much talked about. 
So even in that time, in the time of our beloved master, they all gathered, the men and the women, because of course in the time of the Prophet sallallahu knowledge was available to men and women, as it is today in this room here. It wasn't exclusive to one gender. And in the presence of the Sahaba and the Sahabiyat, the Prophet ﷺ started, it was uh, just before the whole time. He sat on the mimbar and he started to tell them about forthcoming events in headline terms. And then he carried on his speech and it became Asr time. The Prophet ﷺ prayed Asr with his Sahaba. It became Asr time, the Prophet prayed Asr and then carried on his speech. Maghrib time came, he carried on. Isha time came, he carried on. All night he spoke to them in headline terms, what's going to happen? The next Fajr came, the next Zohar came, he carried on telling them. Until he said, and then there will be the Yawmul Qiyamah. All day, all night, he told them about what was going to happen. So I hope you packed your sleeping bags. Because <laughs> that's what I intend to do tonight. To replicate, no, sorry, it's, uh, I've got to get back to uh, Hijaz. But anyway, I'm going to give you some of those summaries of what the Prophet ﷺ told us. But before I do, and I've, what I've tried to do is I've tried to uh, look at the whole body of Hadith and give a summative interpretation of what it is that we should be looking for and what it is that we should not be hyping or sensationalizing. Because of course one day um, I met somebody uh, who told me that, uh, uh, who came to visit me in Hijaz, I was sitting in my office, and he said, I have a letter for you. I said, okay, mashallah, personal delivery, excellent service. And uh, I knew him from about 20 years, and I said, uh, who is this from? He said, read it. So I opened the letter, and I read it, and I was slightly confused. I said, uh, Tell me, who is it from? He said, it's from Imam Mahdi <laughs> I said, really? It's from Imam Mahdi my God. So I read it again and again. I said, where did uh, Imam Mahdi give you this letter? He said, well, I went into the mountains in Kashmir and in a cave I found Imam Mahdi And I met him and I told him about you, and I said that you were a good chap. <laughs> so, and you know a thing or two about law, and you know because you're a barrister, and you know a thing or two about this, that. And I said, you're an excellent chap, and I think, and I recommended him that you should become his ambassador. <laughs> so Imam Mahdi Salam said, well done, son. I'm going to write you a letter, go and give it to him. So I've given this letter. So I said, okay, I read the letter and I thought, my God. <laughs> yeah. Because, trust me, this, is, this was the fourth occasion I'd met somebody who told me they'd met him on Medi In my 35 years of public life, this is the fourth occasion somebody told me. So I said to him, I said, listen, young man, what I want you to do is to fly back over. He said, no, can't do that. I said, why? 
He said, I have to take you with me. <laughs> and here's the ticket. I bought the ticket. I thought, oh no, he's going to kidnap me. <laughs> take me to some mountains and sell me off to somebody. You know, I honestly, I read the letter. He was completely delusional. Because Imam Mehdi salam supposedly wrote half the letter in English, half in Urdu, half in Arabic, and half in squiggles that I couldn't understand. <laughs> and I thought, this is absolute nonsense that is being peddled here. I met somebody else who was a professional person. He told me, my murshid has told me that I must stop being a doctor, because he was a doctor. He said, my murshid has told me I've got to stop being a doctor, and I've got to learn archery. Because Imam Mehdi is about to come, and I've got to learn how to do archery. So when I do learn archery, I don't need to do medicine, I don't need to go into the hospital, I need to learn archery. And you know what he did? In the hype of it all, he sold his house, resigned at the hospital, believing this man who told him that Imam Mahdi is here. And I said to this man, he was a very intelligent guy, he was a doctor working in a hospital, he was a, a senior house officer. I said to him, when did uh, this sheikh tell you that uh, Imam Mahdi is going to come? He said, the year 2000. It's the year of the Armageddon. And I'm pretty sure that this sheikh had seen a film somewhere. <laughs> you know, like you get the 2000 film and the 2012 film. You know, and all these Armageddon stories that, you, that we hear. So I said to him, is this really true that he said, he said, look, I've got a book here which he's written in which it says that Imam Mehdi salam, is going to come in year 2000. So I thought, well, this is a book and I've got to really take it on its face value. So now when I met this sheikh, I said to him, have you written this book? He said, yes, I have. So I thought, well, you know, in, in 1997, 98, I was slightly confused. So I started pondering over it. Year 2000 came, and I asked one of his khalifas, I said, uh, 2000 has passed. What happened? He said, you know, our sheikh has told us, he met Imam Mahdi salam, and he said it was going to be the end of the world, but the problem is he's deferred everything, he's adjourned everything because he wasn't feeling well. <laughs> Now, I'm not telling you stories that I've heard or stories that... These are direct stories that have come to me. Now, I look at all... Of, I hear all of these stories. So, I ask people, do you actually know what the obvious sign is of Imam Mahdi alayhi salam? People who have met him, people who say they know him, people who have said they know of somebody who knows him. And you know the reality is they don't even have the first clue about what the first obvious sign of Imam Mahdi is. And should I tell you what it is? The first and obvious sign of Imam Mahdi <coughs> is that he will have no bones in his body. Hmm? We should all say SubhanAllah. His physical structure will be total flesh. There will be no bone in his body. And as you meet him, you will, be able, you will not be able to feel any bone in his body at all. Completely flesh. And through the miracle of how Allah creates exceptional creation, he will have created the jasad of Imam Mahdi So, Imam Mahdi is not a joke. 
It's not a hype. It's not sensationalism. It's a very serious situation. Now, it's not wrong to contemplate over it. I'm not advocating that. Because Prophet taught us, go to the graveyard. It will help you reflect and help you focus your mind about death. Prophet Sallallahu Hadith, many narrations tell us to await the time of the Jal and Imam Mahdi Why? Because it helps us to focus our minds about the end of time. There was once a woman who was in the slavery of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet ﷺ said, ask what you will. And she said, Ya Rasulullah, I have served you all my life. Make dua that one of my offspring is a servant of Imam Mahdi The companions, the servants of the Mahdi will not be ordinary people. They will be selected, chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The reason why, when you look at the whole body of hadith, there is the mention of reflection about Yawm al-Qiyamah is because it helps you to understand. The whole exegesis of hadith helps you to understand that life is not terminal. Existence is not terminal. We're not going to live forever. Mankind is not going to live forever. Your progeny will not live forever. Of course, there is life and death for us. But as we continue to procreate and have children, well, if yesterday's bill in the House of Commons has anything to do with the extension of humanity, it is really the end of time. <laughs> because they're not going to have any more babies. If Jack marries Jim, if Mary marries Sue, well, that is really the end of time for them. They don't mean Yom al They've got a mini Yom al brewing very quickly. Somebody asked me, what is this that's going on? What do you say? I say, I'm speechless. I'm God smart that people are creating a mini Jahannam on this earth. But anyway, that's another matter. For the first time in the history of mankind, the people of Lut, they did all sorts. Other qawms, they did all sorts. People did the worst of the worst. But Jim did not marry Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't happen ever in the history of humanity. And now, well, you know, they have these slides going around the internet <laughs> saying these Muslims, they are going to be 50% of the Western world. Amen. Huh? MashaAllah. Sheikh has many children as well. <laughs> MashaAllah. And may you all have lots of children as well. Alhamdulillah. And have happy marriages. You can say Amin. Amin. Don't be shy. <laughs> but, you know, they have these uh, figures going around the internet. Oh, Muslims are going to be 30% in France, 40% in Germany, 30% in the UK in 2020. Well, of course we are. Because we have marriages between man and a woman, and we will have children. <laughs> and if you continue to pass these laws, you're not going to get anything from anyone. Except a lot of smell. But anyway, those are the mini signs where we are creating uh, the end of times by ourselves. You know what they call own goals? These are humanity's own goals. 
where our own conduct slaps us in the face ourselves. Now, I've given you an extreme example of mankind's own goal, Western civilization's own goal. But what about our own goals as well? Well, we <laughs> pretend we're Muslims, but we're actually not. When we say we are, we've got Iman, and we haven't. And this leads me very nicely onto the very first thing Rasulullah said. He said, Do you know how the beginning of the end is going to happen? He said, Shame will come to Madinatul Munawwara. You know what we call in Urdu Sharam? In Arabic, we say haya, not living, but haya, as in the modesty, the shame that we have, shame as an entity, will go to Medina Sharif, will present itself to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and will say, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, there is no one person in humanity who's got shame left. Not one of Allah's creation, human beings, has shame. And at that <coughs> time, Prophet Sallallahu will turn his face away. And when Mahbubi Kibriya will turn his face away, that will be the beginning of the end. When you have shame inside you, when you have modesty and haya inside you, you will be the guarantor that the end of time will not come. Another hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, where he said, when Allah will begin to unfold the end of times, <coughs> ilm, knowledge, will be taken away from mankind. And I don't need knowledge as in just everything, but the desire to seek knowledge of what Allah has said, what Rasulullah has said, what his Sahaba have said, what his progeny have said, that desire will be lifted from mankind. And that will be the beginning of the end. So if you have in your hearts and in your minds the desire to learn ulum al-Qur'an, ulum al-Hadith, ulum al-Fiqh, that desire will be the guarantee that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not bring the end of time. And I've also, and I'm going to give you this list because for what it's worth, I... Uh, looked at the whole body of hadith and I tried to conclude what I thought were the pertinent signs of the end of time. Muslims will kill each other on a large scale. <coughs> Storms will hit in the hot season so there will be a reversal of the weather Mounting waves of the ocean, these are the words of the Hadith. You will know it as the tsunami. The Euphrates will uncover a mountain of gold. And armies will battle and will die for it. And the mountain of gold is not necessarily the yellow gold. Many of the Muhaddisin have said, that this also depicts the black gold oil that's in the bosom of those lands. Iraq, Syria, and Egypt, their currencies will be hit. There will be a fire from Hijaz. Hijaz is where Makkah Sharif and Medina Sharif is. A fire will erupt from Hijaz that will illuminate Basra. 
a city many thousands of miles away. Buildings of Medina to Munawwara shall extend to Yahab and for miles and miles these buildings will continue to extend. The women who are the tribe of Dors will start prostrating to idols. People would want to take refuge in graves. There will be senseless killing where the murderer will not know why he murdered and nor will his victim. The GDP in Iraq, and this is my transliteration, the GDP in Iraq will be next to nothing. There will be, these are also, I found this quite um, ironical. There will be an embargo on Syria by the Romans. And of course, by the Romans, Prophet ﷺ depicted the Western uh, civilization. And by then, 30 impostors will be claimed to be Nabi. People will stop paying zakat. Now, we all know that these are five, there are five fundamental pillars of Islam. But when somebody is asked, did you pay zakat? People don't have a clue. And Prophet ﷺ said that people will categorically stop paying zakat. Husbands will be obedient to wives. No, no, this is half the hadith. Right? <laughs> Husbands will be obedient to wives in un-Islamic acts. Of course, there's nothing wrong where a husband uh, listens to the wife or the wife listens to the husband but in un-Islamic acts the husband will not be the moral guide for the wife but he will succumb to her protestation that there should be un-Islamic acts religious knowledge will be disseminated for money purposes as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forewarned, Do not sell my signs, my ayat, for a small price. Leadership will be in the hands of mischievous, greedy, and ill-mannered people. There will be open consumption of wine. Music and dance will become very popular as will the instruments that lead that music. Men will start changing their faces. And if you look at the, so I looked at this a little bit more deeper, and what I realized is that um, the incidence of transgenderism is so high today, where actually men want to become women and women want to become men. And I don't mean it just in character, but the reality is uh, in their dress as well. The other day I was uh, walking in London going to a meeting and I saw this uh, person um, who was dressed in a woman's clothes, but when this person spoke, it was the voice of a man. I, I was absolutely amazed and shocked and, uh, you know, uh, sh she apparently <laughs> you know, passed me and, of course, I was talking to a friend and, and he or she started saying, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, and, you know, because obviously I was dressed like this and he or she thought that they can make ten pounds by saying that, or whatever they thought. Uh, you know, it reminds me of a, and some of you may understand Punjabi, uh, a very uh, dear poet, Asrad al-Yasrad. He came to these shores about 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 
And he looked at the state, and it, when he came, there's a lot of punk rockers, you know, with lots of, um, you know, uh, spiked hair, and there was all sorts of, uh, and, and Boy George, and all of that sort of fashion as well. So he, he wrote a poem, and I remember one part of it. He said in uh, Punjabi, Manu pehle chaka ke kaki ke kaka. Which means that uh, I'm, I'm absolutely uh, amazed or confused is this a boy or a girl, kaki or a kaka? Because obviously this was uh, his uh, interpretation of what he saw. Um, but anyway, my dear brothers and sisters, I'm going to try and uh, bring this to uh, some kind of conclusion because what I'll do now is I'll actually give you the final countdown. What will be the sequence? Because there's a lot of confusion around that. So I will give you a little countdown of what will be the actual uh, uh, countdown, uh, the final countdown. The Jal, the one-eyed being, and many have uh, called the scream the Jal. Many have called the television the Jal. Many have called the internet the Jal. And uh, you know, many have called different things the Jal. Many have called the, uh, you know, the one eye on the dollar, the sign of the Dajjal. Many have called Monster Inc. Dajjal. <laughs> you know, many, many people have different interpretations of what Dajjal is. But the reality is that Dajjal is not a non-animate being. Dajjal will be an animate being. He will have an animate existence. And the Jal will claim to be a prophet. So he will say, I am Nabi. So a few moments ago I told you that there will be 30 famous people who claim to be Nabis. The Jal will be the last of them. And actually he will have possessed power. So he will say, look, I can do different things. So he will say, rain. And it will rain. He will say sunshine, and it will become sunshine. He will say snow, and it will start snowing. So he will have control over the elements. So he won't be just um, an imposter who will have funny, funny, different sort of uh, things. There was once a Nabi, and uh, you know, people said, "Well, Rasulullah's angel who brought revelation, his name was Jibreel." What is the name of the angel that brings you revelation? He said his name is Kapkapi. <laughs> and this is a real prophet, uh, not real prophet, a real imposter prophet who uh, made such a claim in uh, India. He said, uh, my angel is called Kapkapi. So obviously, apart from just imposters who just make claims and pretend they're prophets, or, you know, they pretend they're prophets when they're on drugs. <coughs> you know, this will be a man who will claim to be a prophet with a one eye, but he will actually be able to control the elements. So, he will be joined by 70,000 people who are of the Yehudi uh, uh, tendency and following. And his rumors shall erupt in Syria and an army of 12,000, army of 80 divisions of Muslims will rise, and in each division, there'll be 12,000 Muslim soldiers who will rise with them to fight the Jal. But despite his lesser numbers, so I don't know what 12,000 times 80 is, it's quite a lot of Muslims, but they will be defeated by the Jal, who will be accompanied by 70,000 Yehudis. So 70,000 Yehudis will overpower these Muslims, because they'll probably be Muslims like me, you know, very weak, not, no real Iman. You know, when somebody says anything against the Prophet, so I said, no, oh, it's okay, we should be liberal, it doesn't matter. Just recently, we, we had a film of 15 minutes called Innocence of Muslims, 15 minutes of total abuse 
and swearing and slander on Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And because of the excellent response of the Muslims, now they made another uh, movie, one hour, 15 minutes, funded by Terry Jones, which has one hour, 15 minutes of swearing and abuse on Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And all the Muslim world is, well, you know, we should go and have pizza, we should go and do our thing, and we should carry on, doesn't matter. So what, who cares? You know, there's a delusional people that are swearing at the Prophet Wasallam. So you know, there'll be people like me, who have very weak iman, who, who can sleep in their beds when somebody is swearing at their Rasul So there'll be millions of those Muslims and the Jal will smash the, the, the bastions of those Muslims because they will have nothing inside them. They will have nothing outside of them. And then, after his victory, he will try to enter Makkah Sharif and Medina Sharif. He will not be allowed to enter and he will proceed to Syria. And at that time, Isa alayhi salam will come. Isa alayhi salam will come at the central mosque. Now, there's a minaret there that's actually, the Prophet said, it will be a white minaret on which Isa alayhi salam will come to fight the Jal. Imam Mahdi alayhi salam will have already, as uh, Sheikh told you earlier, will have already come, and Isa salam, will come. And actually what happened, it's a very interesting story, because the Prophet salam, said in that mosque, there's a white minaret, on the white minaret, next to that mosque, and that Isa salam, will come. So the reality is that for about 1300 years, there was no white minaret next to the mosque. It was actually a green minaret. And what happened was, underneath that green minaret, a Yehudi had a shop. And when there was rebellion and revolution, he stored some uh, explosives in his shop and they backfired and blew up that whole minaret. And when the Yehudi was presented to the judge, the Qadi al-Qudar, in Damascus about 150 years ago, the Qadi said, well, you're your punishment is that you have to rebuild that minaret. Obviously, there's been no loss of life, so we can't, there's no reparations about that, but there is this minaret that needs to be rebuilt, you need to rebuild it. And in his hurry, obviously he forgot what color it was, he rebuilt a white minaret. So when the Muslims saw that, they said, no, we want a green minaret. So the, co the case came back to the Qadi al qudha and uh, the Muslims petitioned that, look, he built a, green, a white one, he should build the same one that was there for many centuries. And the Qadi al qudha said, no, the white minaret has been rebuilt in anticipation for the coming of Isa al -Isa. So, there will be a man who will rule Syria and Egypt together. So when you see that uh, the ruler of Syria and Egypt is the same, that is the beginning of the final countdown. He will have killed and murdered barbarically and without any reason many of the Sadar, the Prophet's family. The, there will be a battle between Muslims and the uh, with the ruler of Rome and Christians and Christians will invade Constantinople and some Muslims will side with them but in the end Muslims will be victorious then the Christians will rule Syria and Muslims will rule Medina Sharif Imam Mahdi will go to to Medina Sharif, from Medina Sharif to Makkah Sharif. And in his tawaf, while he'll be doing tawaf, three men will recognize Imam Mahdi 
and they will give bayah to him. They will, those three men, selected men, will become his first servants. And they will raise the voice, this is Khalifatullah, the Viceroy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, come to reclaim in the name of Allah and his beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And a large number of people will join Imam Mahdi alayhi salam and an army from the clan of Abu Sufyan will attack this army but they will be sunk in the deserts of Medina. This army will meet Isa alayhi salam from Medina Sharif. This army will meet Isa alayhi salam who will come and appear in Syria and they will meet together And then, as that meeting takes place, Imam Mahdi salam, will pass away. Isa salam, will do battle with the Dajjal, will slaughter the Dajjal, the, the and then Isa salam, will take his followers to Mount of Tur, and then he will return back to Medina Sharif, he will take his army to the mountains of Tur, return back to Medina Sharif, where Isa salam, will pass away and he will be buried in the spot next to Rasulullah. As you know, that in the place, the mausoleum, the Rana Sharif, where the Prophet وسلم, is buried, there is first the Prophet of Islam, Rasulullah. Then next to him is my grandfather, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq. And then next to him is Hazrat Umar Farooq, no, the second Khalifa of Islam. And there's room for one more grave in the Hujra of Amma Aisha, anha, whose house these three graves were planted. And the fourth grave, which is the one grave uh, space that's left, that will be the grave of Hazrat Isa <coughs> And after that, Gog Magog will come and they will, he cra uh, they will uh, create havoc and Isa salam, will be uh, succeeded by a man called uh, uh, Jahja, Jahja, who will be a just and several, uh, a just ruler. And then there will be a fog that will kill the infidels over three nights and the sun will rise from the west. The mountain of Safa will crack and creatures will emerge. This will brighten the face of believers and darken the face of disbelievers. Then an aroma will kill the Muslims and Abyssinians will dominate the world. They will dominate everything else in the world. At that time, the central place of uh, material goods production will be Syria, which will produce the cheapest goods in the world. And three to four years later, on the 10th of Muharram, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will order Asrafil to blow the flute, the horn, which will be the Yawm al Qiyam. <coughs> the end of everything that has existed. And that is a shamsu kuvirat. As it's explained in the Quran, there will be no explosion. There will be, there will be no explosion of matter. There will be no explosion of existence or human matter or human existence or physical existence. There will be no explosion. There will be an implosion of existence of matter and that implosion will mean that uh, there will be nothing left and Yawm al Qiyamah will come the day of reckoning where uh, all of us who, who will have passed away will be resurrected rekindled brought back to life again and you know finally People think Yawm al Qiyamah is the day of Hisab, where Hisab Kitab is done, where accounting is done of your deeds. No. Yawm al Qiyamah is not the day of 
accounting. Accounting for your deeds, good or bad, is done within the first 40 days of your demise, in your qabr. And reflection of the condition of your qabr will be whether you are good or bad, you're going to enter into Jannat or Jahannam. So if you've done bad, Prophet said, one of the punishments in your qabr will be that the qabr will crush you, your body, 70,000 times per second. Your body will be resurrected and then crushed again, resurrected, crushed again, 70,000 times per second, just to give you a taste of what's to come. And those of you, inshallah all of you, that will we have done good deeds in the first 40 days when your Hisab Kitab is done. In, those, in that period, then the angels of Jannat will come and they will take that seven foot by four foot grave and they will expand its existence so that it becomes part of Jannat. So your Qabr will actually become either part of Jannat or if you get a crushing sensation, you know where you're going. <laughs> so uh, that's what will happen. But, so you're, you will know automatically in your qabr which, which uh, direction you're heading. But, the day of Qiyamah is, uh, and I just want to um, uh, clarify this fallacy as well, because people think that's when Hisab Kitab said, no, that's the day of reckoning. When there'll be a big massive screen huge screen, and billions and billions of people will be gathered from Adam salam to the last man standing. All mankind will be gathered, and a big screen will appear. Well, this is my interpretation of it, when we say a big screen. And then there will be a name. What's your name? Sakim. Huh? Sakim. Sakim. So Brother Sakim, with his picture, and his address, and his date of birth, and his date of death, and his whole life will be on that screen. And everybody will say, oh, mashallah, what a great person he was. Yeah? And if it was mine, they'll say, oof, how bad he was. It will be all clear on the screen. Yeah? So all of mankind will be able to see what people have done, what each and every person has done, what you hid, what you did not declare to people, it will be shown not just to your friends or family, but to the whole of humanity. And on that day, when there will be people who will have done bad, and the angels of Jahannam will come and say, we've got a dress for you from Jahannam. There's a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that the Prophet Sallallahu said, there will be a man, he told his Sahaba, who will come and he will insert a disc. Now this is my interpretation. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said a pouch. But my interpretation is, he will insert a disc in the computer. And suddenly, all of the red, all of the black sins will be wiped out. And the angels from Jannat will come. And the man will say, excuse me, angels, what disc was this? What pouch was this that was inserted into my screen that wiped off all of my bad deeds? The angels will say, this pouch contained all the darood used to read on Rasulullah. Huh? Oh. Shifa, intercession. That day of reckoning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will sit on his throne, on his kursi, and he will see mankind, and he will be doing justice. All good deeds or bad deeds will be seen by each and every person. But then, Right behind everyone will be Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he will say, "Allah, I will not raise my hand, my head 
from such dhar until all of the sins of my mother forgive us. And Allah will say, Ya Rasulullah, oh my beloved Rasul, please enter into paradise. The Jannatis are waiting for you. They are waiting for the dula of Jannah to come, the crown of Jannah to come. And, and Rasulullah sallallahu will say, Ya Allah, how can I go to Jannah? How can I become the blossom of Jannah when one of my ummatis is burning in Jahannam? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show mercy. There will be intercession on that day. And then the Prophet sallallahu ummah will be in Jannah and we will live happily ever after as his slaves. And I want to end when a man asked the question to, his, to the master, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he said, Ya Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when is the day of judgment? When is the day of Yom Al Qiyamah? The Prophet asked, My dear Sahabi, what have you done to prepare for the day of judgment? The Sahabi answered, and his aqidah was correct. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I have prepared for the day of judgment, for the day of reckoning, by loving you, Ya The Prophet ﷺ didn't say, excuse me, bid'ah, shirk, astaghfirullah, go and read kalima again. <clears throat> you know, like sometimes we have some scholars and brothers who are bid'ah and shirk machines. <laughs> Everything you do, they say, bid'ah brother, shirk brother. And sisters as well. Huh? <laughs> you know, no, Prophet didn't answer him like that. When he said, Ya Rasulullah, I have prepared for the day of judgment by loving you, Ya Rasulullah. The Prophet replied, Al Mar'u Ma'man Ahabba, O my Sahabi, you will rise on the day of judgment with the one you love the most. <laughs> so, my dear brothers and sisters, let's make this our aim. Not when is the Jal coming? When is Imam Mahdi coming? When is Isa coming? When is the final countdown? Or those people who create hype by telling you the Jal's here, Isa is here, Mahdi is here. No. We should do what is in the Sunnah. Al Mal'u Ma'man Ahabba. We should love Rasulullah and prepare for the Day of Judgment. Thank you very much. Salam. La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah.